Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the videos relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. This video is called The Wonder and Science of a Solar Eclipse. There's no sight so glorious in the sky as a total solar eclipse, but you have to be ready to travel to see one, as you may have realized during the recent eclipse on April the 8th, 2024. And you also need to keep your eye on the weather. Partial eclipses are also interesting, and I'll talk about them a little also. I had taught high school physics and astronomy for a decade without seeing a total eclipse. Then, in 1991, I was invited to a teacher conference in Columbia, South America. I had already taught there for several years and had friends there. Now, I was invited back for the same month as the great solar eclipse of July the 11th, 1991. Probably not a coincidence, as they knew how much I wanted to see a total eclipse. And this one went right through the country of Colombia. It was a never-forgotten experience. So here's a map showing the path, the eclipse path of the 1991 eclipse. And the totality is the dark band in the very middle. Only people that are living in that uh, area will see a total eclipse. And you can see it goes through the country of Mexico and then right through the country of Colombia. This eclipse was unique as the sky totally darkened for seven long minutes. When totality began, I saw the sun's beautiful corona for the very first time in my life. A fellow physics teacher, Andrew Nunn, was with me there. He had binoculars. While I watched the time, he studied the solar prominences stretching out 100,000 kilometers into space. He also remembers seeing the elusive planet Mercury, which always stays close to the sun. So there's the corona in 1991, just a gorgeous sight. And there's the prominence, as you can see the little pink on the top and bottom there coming out from the sun. So the sun is 100, is 100 times larger than Earth. So these little pink flames or gases coming out from the sun were many times uh, wider than the diameter of Earth. Quite amazing. Two eclipses crisscrossed North America recently. The first was on August the 21st, 2017. My cousin Alan and I drove 12 hours from Toronto south to Nashville to see it. Although totality was only two minutes this time, it was still worthwhile. So there's the paths of the two eclipses in 2017 and 2024. You can see the path in 2024 is a little wider because totality was four minutes, not two minutes as in 2017. We followed the partial eclipse using our solar eclipse glasses. This is in 2017. Then came the beautiful corona, as well as some planets. After the 1991 and 2017 eclipses, which I had seen both of, I was sad that none of my other 10 family members had seen one. That all changed on April the 8th, 2024. Two of my daughters, with husband and children, went from Toronto to nearby Hamilton, where the sky opened up just before totality. Cirrus clouds only obscured the sun's corona a little. The sky also opened up in Dallas, Texas earlier that morning, where my wife and eldest daughter and husband were. Through thin clouds, they saw the solar corona, solar prominence, and nearby planets. My grandson Gavin and I, however, drove up five hours from Dallas up into Arkansas for a clearer sky. Gavin set up his camera with tripod and clock drive. The next figure shows six of his photos. So here's first the four of his photos. Um, as we go from left to right, we're going through the partial phase, first hour, and you can see at the right that the moon is almost completely blocking the sun. So we had solar eclipse glasses on during this phase. You have to do that. And then we come to totality, and we can take off our solar eclipse glasses, and with our naked eyes, we can see the corona. And we can also see the prominences. You can see two of them at the bottom here, two pink prominences, uh, pink gas flaring up from the sun, 100,000 kilometers into the air. During solar eclipses, you usually see planets near the sun. It's quite amazing in the middle of the day. 
Mercury is always near the Sun as the closest planet, but it's difficult to see. Venus also stays near the Sun and is much brighter. In 1991, we saw with our own eyes Venus and Jupiter on the same side of the Sun. In 2017, we saw Venus, Jupiter, and Mars. Then in 2024, we saw Venus and Jupiter on opposite sides. I later realized, however, using Starry Night software, that Mars and Saturn were also present. Uranus and Neptune were also up in the sky, but they are only seen with a telescope. So here's what we saw with Starry Night. This is not a photograph, but a simulation. So you can see that Jupiter on the left and Venus on the right, they were quite bright. We saw them easily. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, you can't see without a telescope. However, at the bottom right, Saturn and Mars were up. I didn't see them. I hadn't known that they were there. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon comes between the sun and earth. Let me show you a diagram of this. So there you see it. This is not to scale. There you see the sun, the yellow sun, and the blue earth, and the white moon just in between. And you can see the rays drawn in straight lines from the sun to the earth. So the large gray circle on the earth is the penumbra. It's the partial eclipse where some rays from the sun get through. In fact, people in the partial eclipse area in the penumbra hardly notice that an eclipse is happening. I'll talk about that later. But the little black round spot in the middle is the umbra, the total eclipse. People there see totality, just a very small area of the earth, only that travels. So you might think that eclipses should happen every month as the moon orbits Earth monthly. The moon's orbit, however, is tilted at a five degree angle to the plane of Earth's orbit. That wasn't shown in the past diagram. And eclipses only occur when the two orbits cross, which is twice a year. You can look at my written essay to see a NASA website that shows how that works twice a year. Total eclipses are the real prize. But partial eclipses, when we are in the penumbra, as we saw in the diagram, can be interesting also. One of the weirdest sensations I ever experienced was during a partial eclipse. I was at my in-law's cottage north of Toronto, sailing with a good breeze under the bright sun. Gradually, I felt the sky becoming dimmer. Since there wasn't a cloud in the sky and it was still four hours to sunset, my mind told me this feeling must be an illusion. But the dimming effect continued. It finally dawned on me that I must be experiencing a partial solar eclipse. When I checked my astronomy almanac that evening, I found that a total solar eclipse had indeed forged a narrow path through the province of Quebec, but that was a thousand kilometers away. However, I was still on the path of the partial eclipse. In fact, the moon's shadow still covered 80% of the sun where I was. While the path of totality might only be 100 kilometers wide, a very narrow path, the path of those who see a partial eclipse can be up to 10,000 kilometers wide. Here's a diagram showing this partial eclipse. So the total eclipse was that very narrow blue line in the middle, which goes through the middle of the province of Quebec. However, I was near the Great Lakes, the middle of North America on the right side there, a thousand kilometers away, and I was still in the partial eclipse thing. Many people in the partial eclipse don't notice it because even if 80% of the sun is covered, the sun is still so bright you hardly notice that an eclipse is happening. A ring or annular eclipse is that something else that happens. It occurs when the moon is a little farther from Earth than usual, therefore it's a bit smaller, or the sun is a little closer to Earth and therefore it's a bit bigger. And so therefore, when the moon and the sun occur at exactly the same place in the sky, the moon doesn't quite block out the sun, and you get a ring of the sun outside the moon's disk. So you don't see the solar corona. In fact, the, the sky doesn't really get dark enough. You hardly notice it. My grandson Gavin took a photo of the annular eclipse that passed through Dallas in October 2023. So there it is. So the moon doesn't quite blot out the sun. You have to have a very strong filter on your camera to get this picture. An annual eclipse passed through my home city of Toronto back on May the 10th, 1994. 
I remember warning students and teachers, as I was a science consultant in the Board of Education there, not to look directly at the sun. It could safely be seen using solar eclipse glasses. Or you could also project the sun through a telescope or a pair of binoculars onto white paper. I talk about that in Appendix 2 of the written essay. Can solar eclipses be seen on other planets in our solar system? That's an interesting question. According to the latest information from NASA, there are 293 moons going around six planets in our solar system. One moon around Earth, of course, two little moons around Mars, 95 moons around Jupiter, 146 moons orbiting Saturn, 28 orbiting Uranus, and 16 orbiting Neptune and even five orbiting the dwarf, the dwarf planet Pluto. Granted, most of these moons are very tiny, but there are four moons around Jupiter that are larger than our moon. And so you would expect that there are eclipses on Jupiter caused by its larger moons, and indeed there are. So here's a photograph of them. So you can see a moon on the left, that, that white moon in front of Jupiter, and you can see a moon on the right outside of Jupiter, but on the face of Jupiter, you can see round black spots, which are the shadows of the moons. So if you happen to be there, you could see a total eclipse of the sun. However, you can't be there because you can't stand. Jupiter is all gaseous. There's no rocky place to stand. And in fact, spaceships can't even go there. So no people or spacecraft have ever photographed a total eclipse right near the surface of Jupiter. Even the same is true of Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Even if there were, the moons were large enough, and there is one moon of Saturn that's quite large, you can't be there. On rocky Earth, however, not only can we be there, not only have we seen total eclipses over centuries, but we have the perfect eclipse ratio. The sun is 400 times farther from us than the moon, but the sun is also 400 times larger in diameter than the moon. So the moon is exactly the same diameter in the sky as the sun, half a degree. So when they arrive in the same place, the moon just covers the sun for a few minutes. That allows us to see with our naked eye the beautiful corona and the prominences of the sun appearing just around the edge of the moon's surface. In fact, in the four billion year history of Earth and moon, it's only now in the epoch when humans live on Earth that this perfect ratio holds true that people standing on Earth can see total solar eclipses with the corona and the prominences around. For some reason, the one who controls all the motions of the stars and planets in the universe and in our solar system decided that a total solar eclipse would be an interesting addition to the wonders of nature that people can enjoy on Earth. Solar eclipses are not explicitly mentioned in the Bible. You can see Appendix 3 in the written essay for more on this. But here's how we can think of them from a faith perspective. God is in total control of nature. Natural laws are not independent of God. Rather, they are the way he upholds the universe. In fact, God's consistency in maintaining natural laws illustrate his faithfulness to his people. That's something interesting and worth thinking about. In the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord appeals to his consistency in nature when he assures his people of his faithfulness to his covenant with King David. I'm going to quote this paragraph. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, the Lord says, so that day and night no longer come at their appointed time, i.e. the motion of the moon and sun and earth, then my covenant with David can be broken and David will no longer have a descendant to reign on his throne. That's in Jeremiah chapter 33. And Psalm 147 presents basically the same argument. Because God faithfully acts in a consistent way in nature, we can predict eclipses years ahead and date eclipses long ago. And we can count on God's faithful actions in other ways than in keeping his promises to us. A word of warning, however, about God's consistency in regulating nature. That doesn't exclude the possibility of him acting in a non-scientific way at critical times. Christ's resurrection is an important example of this. Sir John Houghton, renowned climate scientist who was one of the founders of the IPCC, wrote a book called The Search for God. In that book, he refers to this as a miracle of type 2, 
That is, a miracle like the resurrection of Christ that can't be described scientifically, something that transcends scientific description. He also talks about a miracle of type 1, for example, when a farmer prays for, uh, prays for rain after a long drought and rain arrives, which is interesting because Sir John Houghton was a meteorologist. He was the president of the World Meteorological Association. You can read more about Sir John Houghton in my essay or my video, Contemporary Scientists Who Believe. In conclusion, solar eclipses are fascinating events on their own. But for those who believe in an infinite personal God, they are just one more piece of evidence that he is a faithful God, consistent in the way he upholds nature for our benefit and for his glory. Thank you for listening.